Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, welcome back and thanks for joining us for episode 6 of Whelm season 4. My name is Rich and with me is my co-host Emily and producer Neil. Hey everyone, in these review episodes we'll be diving into the plots, characters, easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes but we'll be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. How? Are you kidding? She still goes by Artemis Croc. It took me three minutes on the internet. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is Artemis Through the Looking Glass. The release date was November 11th, 2021. The in-episode dates are April 19th through 20th. The writer was Brandon Vietti. The director was Christina Soda. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits include Troy Baker as Todd Donner and Brian Marcroft. Woohoo! Check it out. Jeff Bennett as Jason Bard. That's very exciting. You can talk about him now. That was so, no, it was just so easy to say. I'm still excited about that. <laughs> Logan Browning as Onyx. Nick Chinland as Sportsmaster. Greg Griffin as Looker. Josh Keaton as Eric Needham and Black Spider. Mae Whitman as Wonder Girl and Spoiler. Gwendolyn Yeo as Lady Shiva and Rictus. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode picks up where last week's left off, with Artemis explaining the Onyx and Cassandra Savage situation to a very unhappy Jade, who only agrees to help because Leon could be in danger. After the credits, we get a quick insight into the fact that Beast Boy's not doing too great after returning from Mars, and in a flashback, we see a young Jade return home briefly to ask a very injured Artemis for help only to be kicked out again by Sportsmaster. Back in present-day Star City, Cassandra Savage uh, and Onyx continue to be unreadable, even by the team's current resident psychic, Looker. And after that night, uh, we get an awkward encounter between Artemis, Jade, and Artemis's new boyfriend, Jason Bard. Because why wouldn't this be awkward for everyone involved? Cheshire then shares that none of her sources can confirm what's really going on with the defectors, so she agrees to interrogate them both herself. In a flashback, we see young Artemis meet up with Jade on a rooftop and give her some food stolen from their kitchen. Jade gives her a book and promises to be back again tomorrow night with enough money for Artemis to restock and avoid getting in trouble. Of course, that works out well. In the present, Artemis lets Cheshire into Green Arrow's vault and convinces Orphan not to kill her. As Cheshire interrogates both defectors, we get to know more about both of their backstories, or at least what they claim their tragic backstories are. And Cheshire can't get any more of a clear answer about who's really telling the truth. The group then gets ambushed by Black Spider and Rictus, who appear to be trying to retrieve Cassandra Savage until Lady Shiva also appears on the scene and kidnaps Orphan. Before leaving, she lays down an ultimatum that Artemis must travel to Santa Prisca alone within the next 24 hours and trade Cassandra Savage for Orphan's life. Both Cassandra and Onyx volunteer to go with Artemis to Santa Prisca, and Cheshire reveals that Orphan is actually Lady Shiva's daughter and insists that Lady Shiva must be bluffing. Artemis isn't willing to risk it, though, and decides to take both Onyx and Cassandra along with her despite Cheshire's refusal to join. And in the flashback, we see young Artemis waiting on a rooftop for hours, but Jade never returns. Instead, Sportsmaster finds out what happened and forces her to train despite her injuries, and lack of food. And back in the present, Halo arrives at the vault for her guard duty, only to find it completely deserted and destroyed uh, as Tigress, Onyx, and Cassandra Savage fly the super cycle to Santa Prisca. I'm here for guard duty. I love duty. Halos. I'm here to help. <laughs> when they come in and they're all, I'm here for guard duty. Good. Yeah. They just want to help. They just, just want to excited to be here. <laughs> I love Halo so much. All right. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. Oh my gosh. You. There's notes everywhere. There's so many notes. Oh my gosh. Mine are on this weird background character stuff, which is nobody's probably that surprised. What do you got, Emily? So, uh, starting off with the big thing, every flashback makes it more and more clear just how messed up Artemis's childhood was. I just, 
this season re- for this whole arc for Artemis and Treasure was a lot of just let's take the subtext from season one and two and turn it into actual text, and it's awful. Have I mentioned that I hate I hate Crusher? He's bad. Have I any, have I also. Uh, so as Neil pointed out, you know, training despite her injuries and lack of food, awful. I'm also going to throw out kids showed up at school with a black eye and a broken arm and apparently nobody thought maybe to intervene. I am unconvinced she's going to school because I thought that's the same thing. As soon as you have a black guy like that's some get crap done. And then she's she's got a cast on, right? Yeah, she has a cast and she it's a in a, and a tiger sling. print uh, sling. Mind tiger you. print sling. Yes. So she had to go to someone to get that broken arm fixed. So you mean to tell me it's someone legit? I do not think. No, so. not at all. I a hundred percent believe Sportsmaster knows mob doctors that he's taken her to. So like, I don't think she's. I don't know. Part of why I say Artemis is going to school is because we know by season in season one that she is going to school pre moving to Gotham Academy. Like, so I don't know. I have assumed Artemis has just been going to school and everything is just still awful. She also reads so much above her age level. Yeah. I mean, we can get into why that is probably an escape. Yeah. Gosh. So, uh... and how many times does she just get this nine year old, just get left alone? Yep. And again, I say Artemis nine. She's she's not, she's left alone. The crush has gone 36 straight hours. He's going on missions all the time, right? Yep. Yep. So she's just alone. Jade's not there anymore. Did you know that Sportsmaster is an awful dad? <laughs> Have you heard? Man, the worst. you're not joking, man, about like the implications from season one and two and then the practicalities of it. I will always go back to the fact that season one has the completely offhand thrown away line of Artemis saying, my dad probably wants me to kill you, that she says, no surprise and no, no hesitation, which to me implies that that has happened to Artemis before, which is a wild bit of subtext to only be made far more likely with each passing season. Yeah. Uh, Or at best, like that conversation has come up enough where it's just an assumption. Like, oh my god, grind my teeth. What do I want to say? Anyway, what are other notes I have here on other things? Uh, moving away from the, uh, we'll we'll return to the flashbacks later for English class again. But for now, other things I have. So this is our first episode where we actually see Jason Bard doing anything, mm-hmm. and Jason Bard is fine. He's fine. He's Don't. not Wally or any He's other great. OG member of the team. And therefore, I feel like I haven't seen people really, really gung ho on Chip and Jason Bard and Artemis, but he's fine. Uh, he seems like a nice guy, even though he's very much a bit awkward. I do not ship him and Artemis, unfortunately, for Jason. I love Jason. I love him. I want him to be so happy in life he doesn't yeah, i don't think does he fine. even know what he's getting into no no of course no. he doesn't know what he's getting into you know and that's part of that's part of the thing if i'm like it's well, the thing I'm like artemis you can't i i'm like you can't date somebody who doesn't know the extent of how complicated your life is two things one if we're not calling it bartimus i don't know what we're doing two <laughs> okay he, okay, he, that's, he, that's good. That is a that's decent good. point. He has to that's be good. more aware than I think all three of us just thought, because one of the one of the things that is there in this episode is that we realize he was dating Barbara. Well, I'll get into that. That's one of my other points. Okay. Right. So, You're not wrong. Right. And so, like, if he's got to know, he, I mean, he doesn't have to know something. But if not, this poor dude is so out of the loop. Yeah, I feel like he's just deeply out of the loop because, like. He could just assume that Barbara knows Artemis for any number of reasons. They're adults. Like, you can have friends who lived in other states. Like That's fair, but come on. Like, when when Barbara's like, you know, uh, oh, you're just about ready to find out that I'm really, like, Oracle or whatever. Maybe you should date my other friend who's also got... It, it, it has even more, in many ways, a messed up dynamic going on with... Raising her niece. We'll get into it. It's my next point. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) But can we we get somebody on the show who's into relationships to talk about this? Or, Mm -hmm. uh, ah, we've done it. (laughs) Oh, hey. Good job. Hello. Years ago. (laughs) Do this. So, 
This is why I brought it's a long con, Emily. I brought you on to talk about this relationship. Ship right this here. This one. What I will say is, despite the fact that, like, you know, Jace, Jason Bard is fine. Him and Artemis, eh, whatever. Not, not my, not my fave thing, but whatever. Good for her. Good for them. I am going to say bonus points for showing a disabled veteran as a totally viable romantic option in oh, the yeah. show, though. Like many points this season for that, actually, across the board, because we see it several times with several things. And it's good. Uh, I know this came up in our the discussion that I had with uh, Samwise a while back about like this idea of how it is important to show like they have a totally normal relationship and we see that he has a prosthetic leg. And the fact that the fact that I'm saying that like it's shocking for that to be normal says so much more about like the way we present stuff in media than it does about that actual situation, if that makes sense. Like I'm not Mm -hmm. saying this is shocking. I'm saying it's important to see this in TV. Oh, agreed. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Just wanted to make that clear of what I was trying to say in case it got jumbled there near the end. And also, I really like supportive sister Cheshire. I've missed seeing Cheshire on the show. I like that she shows up, grills this guy after he walks away. She's like, he seems nice. Good for you. Uh, So about these assassins, like, I love Cheshire. I love that. I I love I love the whole like there's uh, there's some kind of like dramatic irony in her saying, oh, I'm actually here to meet an international assassin. Oh, yeah. It's the saying that so casually. So, like, the whole thing, like, does he know? Does he not know? If he knows, that's a different conversation. If he doesn't know, that's, I don't know, is that messed up? Like, oh, yeah, this is my sister. No, I wasn't kidding. She really is an international assassin. (laughs) Like, (laughs) remember that joke from years ago? That was real. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, I fully interpreted that scene as Artemis is just saying that, knowing that he fully won't believe her and that it will be played off as a joke. Right. It's the telling the telling a truth so ridiculous it seems like a lie. Yeah. And gets her out of the conversation kind of thing. But yeah. So now that I've said all that, then moving on to the next point. In this in this episode, we he doesn't say that he dated Barbara. He said right. he dated so, uh, her friend who broke up with me for her ex and blah blah. blah. And we reverse engineered through Google searching Jason Bard's history and whatnot. Ask Greg number two five six nine six can confirm that she did it. Thank you. It is in fact Barbara. Yes, we when this first premiered had to reverse engineer through Google yes. and then oh, that ask Greg has <laughs> happened post us having to uh, figure this out and have a whole conversation about who that could possibly be. But yeah, Jason used to date Barbara, who broke up with him to get back together with Dick Grayson and then set Jason up with Artemis. And all I can say is this friend group will never get less teen drama. And I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's such a convoluted relationship tree. And I love it. Uh, it's good and it's chaos and it's fun. Other little things from this episode. If you pause in the scene where Gar is uh, tragically just rewatching the video of Superboy's fan memorial uh, and just cry about it, because as we all would, if you do what I do, which is pause and try to figure out what everything in Garfield's room is. Uh, I did a whole breakdown of it of, in Scream Something, but I still think that the most interesting bits are the photos that are on the back wall of Garfield's room are one of his mom, the paparazzi photo of him and Queen Perdita that we saw back in season three when we first found out they were dating, uh, and the selfie he took as a gorilla with Angel O'Neill, uh, not Angel O'Neill, Angel oh, O'Day. Angel O'Day, that's right. When he helped her last season. I combined April O'Neill April and Angel O'Neil, yeah, into I one saw character. That. Yeah, exactly, yeah. There should be four turtles back there, too. Uh, so, yeah, I just think that's a fun detail. I like when we see random photos in... Uh, characters rooms it's fun it's good and i'll i'll save english class for later but uh what what do you got neil one of the other one is the mysteries of adolfo shows up once again it's in the stack of books um on the, <laughs> yep. uh, on her nightstand uh and i'm always trying to figure out what i mean i don't feel like i figured it out last time i don't know what it is this time um but you have on the one side you have alice in the cheshire cat uh and then on the other side of the room is like a like a like a rising sun with someone jumping through it with a dragon behind it. And I assume, first off, I just assume that's a reference to something. I just don't yet know what it is referring to. Um, that was, that was my. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to say something and this might be totally incorrect, but my brain is saying in the comics, 
I, I don't know what this poster is, but in the comics, don't we see the same poster in Wally's, Wally's room? room? Okay. I was like, I that popped into my head <laughs> and I couldn't remember for sure. If you can find a shot of it, Neil, send it to me because I, I think I'm following you. But if it's the one I'm thinking of, then I think that's actually Richard Dragon. Let me see. Because we talked. Check if it's in Wally's room. We talked about this, I think, in the comic commentary. We probably did. My brain wants to say it's Richard Dragon. No, in the in the uh, in Wally's room, there is an actual poster of Richard Dragon that has Richard Dragon's signature. Uh, oh, it and does. I'm okay, using that with the much more um, abstract RT poster oh, okay. in All right. Artemis's room that I have always assumed is just like a kung fu movie of generic origin. <laughs> Yeah, because there's no so, there's no writing on scratch it. that uh, for me, but we definitely had this conversation during comments. Oh, commentary I'm sure we did. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. trying to be like, wait, they have the same poster. Yep, head can- head cannon that is what that is a a point in their relationship. Oh, uh, but they both ju- enjoyed those movies together. Done. That's all absolutely I done. Well, I know Rich, you you have it, but Rictus is a very interesting addition. Yeah, a little bit random because Rictus is just like with so many things like Rictus gets pulled. Rictus showed up in a few comics in the 52. Um, I think the Red Hood and the Outlaws, maybe six or seven episodes or issues. I mean, so uh, Rictus was a like a minor member of the League of Assassins. Um, he was male, apparently in the comics, uh, male presenting, had cybernetic enhancements. And the only thing I could find on him is like strong and you know, uh, doesn't tire endurance or whatever, but then also randomly had density shifting powers. Cause you know, it just said cybernetic enhancements and wherever I was reading, it was like the deep, one of the DC wiki things and under cybernetic enhancements, you know, the old classic density shifting cybernetic <laughs> enhancement, you know, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> so, uh, I'm not quite sure what that is. So this is this character. Uh, it, it's obviously a female version of the character. Cybernetics are, more i don't know classically cybernetic i guess the only like apparent body part that's still human you can see are her eyes that like, essentially like sticks her thumb in at one point to get her off of her but that that's pretty much that's pretty much it there's not much else else in it uh of course we have the return of the infamous uh anti spider-man um with josh keen doing the voice again who voiced uh uh, in spectacular Greg's uh, Greg Weissman spectacular Spider Man, um, which I was every time I was always find funny, evil snarky Spider Man. And what is up with the balls? How do you like my balls? It's just like wow. Okay, that's a thing. That Me was, and Cheshire uh, agree on that one. Unnecessary, my unnecessary, dude. unnecessary, dude. Totally, you are evil, Peter Parker for sure. So I have so I have a question about Rictus though. Okay, what yeah. kind of tech do we think they're using? I just it's got a little bit of Kirby tech going on, like the lights that are going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's got that Kirby tech like pattern almost on it. So, I mean, it's certainly possible. Yeah. And the more I think about it, like everything's on the everything's on the table. Mother box, father box, apocalyptin, something that somebody else came up with on Earth or yeah. Martian, or they got it from Rand or. Yeah, right. Yeah, sure. it's like, yeah, absolutely. We do whatever we want. I don't know. Name a planet. I'm not do whatever. Name a planet. Yeah, exactly. And I we I think I'm, we talked about this last episode too. But oh my gosh, both of these assassins are believable. They're just totally believable. I couldn't tell what was going on. I had never heard of Onyx before I saw her in this episode. So not a character that I knew before. So I don't know what her background's supposed to be. And then her story was just kind of funny. Like she talks about, Oh, my grandfather was amazing man. And I'm like, okay, so your grandfather was in the all-star was in the all-star squadron in world war two. How exactly did you get picked up by sensei at 11? Like you didn't go into that. Like you, 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 you speak with reverence about amazing man. So what happened? Because when I looked up Amazing Man, there, I, there's no reference to her, and I don't know anything about that. I, that might be a thing that either it's a reference I just couldn't find, or Greg and uh, Greg and or Brandon made this connection. Um, 
But Amazing Man, he was he's created in the 80s. He's actually an homage to a different Amazing Man that was in it was a different comic company. It's back when there were more comic companies. It was Bill Everett was the creator. And so that's his name. So the DC version became a member of the All-Star Squadron. And so again, All-Star Squadron started in the 80s. And it was kind of like a Justice Society, almost like a Justice Society. I don't want to call it a spinoff. It was like the Justice Society existed before World War II. And then when World War II happened, then the government created, like, brought these people together to become the All Star Squadron, and the All Star Squadron had an enormous list of people who who belonged in it. And then there were some members that split off to create the Freedom Fighters, which was actually had been created by another comic company that DC ended up buying. But what's interesting is that the All Star Squadron, contemporary with the Justice Society, they were two separate groups, but they crossed over a lot. And then the Freedom Fighters included Uncle Sam, uh, the Human Bomb, Doll Man, Phantom Lady, Black Condor. These are these are these are. I I, I have some comics from when I was a kid with the Freedom Fighters. The Ray, which is a character that showed up in um, he showed didn't he show up in the Arrowverse? They did the whole like alternate background the Nazis mm-hmm. won storyline it had ray in it right and then they did like well, an animated that version was the, the spin-off uh a canani- canonical spin-off animated show but continue yes i watched i don't know why Got i it. watched there you everything go. from the arrowverse i don't know it's i'm glad you did because i did then i didn't so but here's the other thing the other two characters who were also members of the freedom fighters were firebrand and red torpedo so from all the way back in season one. Yeah. So uh, the ones that I saw back in the day, uh, back in season one, it looked like they were associated more with the Justice Society. But again, it's really hard to like pull like the uh, All-Star Squadron was like the Justice Society Unlimited. Basically, it was just like it was all the Justice Society members plus, you know, like 30 other people that would come in and out. And then Uncle Sam's the one who split off with the Freedom Fighters to do other stuff. So I don't know how they mix and match them in um, the history of um, Young Justice. They might just make them all the Justice Society and just say that, which I think would be an easier way to go for many reasons. But that's where Red Torpedo and Firebrand were actually from back then. And then we, Jason Bard first appeared in Failsafe in Season 1. He was a Marine. We talked about that back in Season 1. He was a Marine in... The failsafe mental program that John Jones had, had created um, that they were in. And we know his name because the computer, uh, when they're Zadang out, actually names him like Marine. I can't remember what rank he was. Marine Corporal Jason Bard, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, OK, I have a bunch of questions. Like, how does the Zeta tube know that that's him? Like, they didn't have to bypass anything like they have with a bunch of other characters. He didn't have like a number. And also they went out of their way to like name this specific Marine going through. And he he loses his leg. We talk about that in season one, too. And he loses his leg. And so now we see him. But I'm like, where? how did he get in there? How did he get into John Jones's creation of what was going to happen in this, you know, Kobayashi Maru program that he had created? And I'm like, John Jones is a, is a secret identity. He's supposed to be a police detective and then bard was saying like he's working on a professor but actually he's a private detective and i'm like when did you become a private detective and how old are you and when were you a marine and how old were you when you were a marine that john jones might have known you as a marine or did you talk to him while you were a private detective and he was a police detective and told him the story of how you lost your leg as a marine and then he put you in there like there's a whole (laughs) i'm not exactly sure how this connection between these two pans out particularly because i don't have if we the had timelines. to ask greg one four three one two then we can find out <laughs> the, several things one jason bard is considerably older than barbara and is an acquaintance slash friend of john jones who knows that jason injured his leg in combat back when he was a u.s marine so how old is he because he doesn't look that old yeah, I put I I don't know if you saw me have a face at the phrase significantly older than Barbara. Fear not. So Bar- because so we're, we're kind of two five two nine zero would allude <laughs> to the fact that Jason Bard was born in nineteen eighty nine. 
Okay. So this is me trying to do math. Yeah, you do that math because I don't significantly older. I wonder what significantly means. Wait, wait, you math magicians. He's 34. I was born in 86. I can do the math by subtracting. No, well, I mean, he was 34, but I'm trying to figure out like, okay, so how old was. So that means she was born around 94 and he's 89. So his significantly older is five years. Nine, she was born in 95. He was born in 89. She was born in 95 or 96 because she's 15 in season one. And we don't see her. 15. Oh, got you. All right. Because her and so Wally she, are the same age and then he has older. a birthday and there's a bit of a. So what was it? He's 89 and she's 96. She's 95. 95 to 90. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so 95 or 96, depending on what point in the year her birthday falls. <laughs> right, exactly. So five to six years older. Okay. Yeah. Six to when seven. I think significantly older, I think much, I think more than that, but maybe just because I'm, well, you know, I'm old now. But it also, it just depends. It depends on where you're yeah. at in your life. That's true. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So then, wait, he's only five years older. Hold on. So that means he's what? What did you say was thirty four? Mm-hmm. So you said he's thirty four in current timeline. Yeah, so he would have been twenty four. Then Artemis is only like at the only, time of the mm-hmm. Artemis the is only twenty five though. Yeah, at the time of failsafe, he would have been twenty four. Okay, right. And so Artemis, Artemis is only twenty five in this season, so he's nine years older than her. If he's thirty four at this current time. Oh my gosh! This is like a math class, everybody. <laughs> okay, nine years old. Because Artemis is like, fifteen yep, in season older. one, and it's been ten years since Team Year One. Because uh, Miss Martian says that at one point in in her arc, she says her and Connor have right. been together for ten years. Um, right. So it's been ten years since season one. So if Artemis was fifteen in season one, she's twenty five now. So yeah, nine years is okay. A bit. So I guess he it's could a bit have been when you're twenty five. I guess, but um, then how, okay. All right, I don't know about the math. birthday thing, but anyway. English all right. class, math class, we are here to learn today on what. Okay, I may have even, I may be, maybe back in the day, maybe that's why I was thinking about, like, does he know him from back in the, from when he's a police detective? That's starting to sound familiar, but it was six years ago when we recorded that episode, the first episode on Failsafe, so. Is that right? Did I do that math right? Anyway. My point is, all right, so Greg kind of answered those implications, it sounds like, Neil? Yes. Are you reading more? You have your reading face on. I get, we're, something's wrong with our math. Something is wrong with our math. Yeah. We just don't know which way it is. It's the so thing. She like, is definitely the, 25. <laughs> Thank you. I can't do math. He is 31. Okay. There you go. Wait, he was born when? So we were 89? right about six years. 90, 10, 31. So what, ha- what ha- happened was I messed up the math because they're in 2020, not 2023. 20. I don't know what year it is. I got you. At all, ever. So Amazing. <laughs> there you go. He's 31. But that also means okay, he's 21 so- when you see him in fail well, safe. Well, but then- Okay, and that so he's twenty one. That makes sense. So he goes into the Marines right out of high school, and then he got out of the Marines and then went and be- became a private detective. Mm-hmm. That's right. right. He didn't say police detective. He said private detective, right? No, he said private. And detective. so, yeah. yeah, private detective. But then he's trying to become a professor. It sounded like he was implying as well. Okay, I guess that all tracks. Then it just seemed a little strange that John would have Artemis's girlfriend be a friend, a boyfriend be a friend of his. Like the ages seemed to like seemed a little strange. Do we know how long Martians live out of the, out of curiosity? A while. Yeah, because they're because they're prolific replicators, and <laughs> for lack of a better word, I guess they live long. And they're I don't know why they haven't just dominated the universe at this stage. Because okay, because anyway. Earth got fire, man. Earth got fire. Just make some s'mores and scare off all the Martians. Um, you ask and you shall receive. Ask Greg, number 13634, the, uh, about 300 Earth years, more or less. Is Oof. The answer, is the answer okay, to the question so, of how long do Martians live? 
That's great. That's a long time. Okay. Yep. I'm curious about how long John's going to be able to pull off this secret identity. <laughs> you just keep changing anyway. to who you are. Yeah, you just keep changing. I guess. You just keep reinventing. You could just make a different, different one. So now that we've done 20 minutes of math. Oh my gosh. Please cut that down. Anyway. <laughs> I don't think it was 20 minutes, actually. I'm just making a joke. Uh, would we like to transition fr- from math class to English class? Oh, okay. Before before we do, mine are, mine are relatively quick. Looker, basically, Looker has been around. Uh, Wasn't she an eight, outsider? Yep, since the eighties, she joined the Outsiders. She was, but she's also been in the show longer. She was one of the ones that attacked uh, yep. Troya, and then the inhibitor was taken off. She goes to the Tau Center, and just so. Same kind of right. thing in comics and out of comics, basically joins the outsiders, um, so on and so forth, telepathic. So we're good there. And in the show, uh, she goes by Leah, which is one of the nicknames she has outside in the comics. Uh, also, we see Todd Donner as the one of the news people, which is, again, a reference back to the 80s. Because um, why? Why not? Just use the characters that you have. Bring me all your DC Comics newscasters. <laughs> We're putting them all in the show. Todd Donner and Night Zone are basically analogs to the real life Ted Copel and Nightline, um, is when, when they originally made them. Oh, uh, uh, nice. But this is also not the first time we see Todd Donner because if you go to the comics, uh, Young Justice uh, Tort Songs Part One, he is in there. And this is your friendly reminder. Oh, go read the tie-in comics. Go read the tie-in comics. Uh, also, there's a Chicken Whizzy's billboard, and it shows a bucket of chicken. Chicken Whizzy's come in all forms. Never forget. <laughs> it's the most important thing. Uh, so I got a bunch of random notes, but I'm going to do English class first and then get to all my other random little things about these chaos characters. So I said I was going to. And I did. During our podcast hiatus, yes. I read Dumb Luck. <laughs> nice. I went and I got a copy, holding it up to, I'm holding it upside down to show Rich. Holding it upside down on the you, screen. I, yes, I it does the, say Dumb Luck book. on it. It's kind of an orange cover. It is. It's not the same I cover read, as in the, in the no, show. I read all 189 pages of this book. It looks that bigger I than that. It's yeah. it's pretty thin. Oh no, I see. It's a big yeah. book, but it's thin. Uh, yeah. big format, thin spine. So here are the things I've gathered for those of you at home uh, who want to know what is up with this book. Or Whelmed reads it, so you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was published in 1936 as a political satire of the then current state of Vietnam under French colonization. It ridicules both some traditional conservative viewpoints of the time, as well as the modern progressive movement of that same time that was centered around European ideals of what would make a good society. Uh, It was banned for a time in Vietnam between 1960 and 1986 under, I believe, two different political powers, both banned it uh, for various reasons. I... And then the Young Justice tie-in, because we're reading classic literature here to make connections to a superhero cartoon, uh, reading it, looking for connections to Young Justice and specifically to Cheshire and Artemis, I will point out that it focuses on a red-haired disaster man of a protagonist and that the book has an oddly large emphasis on sports as a concept. (laughs) And those are the close... Like, we got more novels coming up in this arc that, like, I can draw more direct connections to Artemis and Cheshire, and I will. We're going to get there. Oh, okay. But but for this one, that's about all I got. Though my biggest takeaway from reading this is that it is absolutely wild to me that Jade gave this book to nine-year-old Artemis. Because, like, you can make the argument with Tale of Two Cities that it is, like, quote-unquote beyond her reading level, but it's, like, It's just a weird piece of very wordy classic literature where there's nothing that inappropriate beyond all that French Revolution murder. But this one is written much more straightforwardly than Dickens because it was written in 1936, but has just a a whole lot of inappropriate material, shall we say. 
<laughs> which is part of why it was banned at one point. Interesting. Um, we're a PG rated podcast, uh, but there's, you know, there's just, there's just several scenes of various, various acts that would not constitute a PG podcast. <laughs> So this is why my theory is that Cheshire straight up just grabbed the first book that uh, had Vietnamese on it and was like, I'll take this to Artemis. Cheshire has never vetted a piece of literature in her life before I handing mean, it to her sister. To her credit, what sticker was on the front of the book? Oh, there is a youth fiction sticker from the Gotham Public Library on that book. Nailed um, it. Which is part of my argument for why I would say that this maybe shouldn't have been in the Gotham Library's YA section is, I don't think most teenagers would find the political satire of 1936 Vietnam all that interesting. <laughs> I don't think they would necessarily get it. I'm an adult, and I still had to read all of the back matter material to understand the full scope of what was going on here. By your implications of what you said is also in the book, it is possible they may not have been reading it for the 1936 political whatever. There may be something else in there they wanted to read. I don't know. I didn't read it. Because I'd argue, I'd argue. Those scenes aren't fun. Uh, oh, okay. Well, there you novel. go. Done. Uh, answered. <laughs> questioned and answered. That's the, the that's the PG version of making this statement. Wow, I'm fascinated. Well, the the only other thing I could think of is like sometimes, like when you have kids that are just abused so badly like this, like it, things can go in lots of different directions, and and one of them is like they just have to grow up too fast. Yeah. Right. right? Yep. We've to always just said that survive. about Agnes and Cheshire. Right. And so these two these two girls just had to grow up so fast. So Cheshire's gotta be just like, yeah, excuse me. You have no idea what I've seen. <laughs> don't don't PG thirteen me. Yeah. Don't yeah. R rated movie me. I, you're just watching it. I've done that. Right? Like that kind of awful garbage. And so I didn't read the book. It doesn't it sounds like I agree with you. I actually may have grabbed it out of a, a mislabeled thing. Maybe the whole Artemis's whole life has been like, why did she give me this? <laughs> um, I mean, there's sports references, so I'm not exactly sure. It sounds like it might have more applicability than the mysteries of Adolfo. I don't know. We're never the real mystery of Adolfo is why it's here all the time. You know um, what? I am absolutely convinced that Greg has got like on the giant conspiracy board in his office. It's like uh, it. it's going to be like the center point season set season six. It's going to bring all it all, strings, all together. All strings, all strings lead, lead to back to Adolfo. <gasps> yeah, that's, um, exactly. that's the number one. When he finally gets to the list of characters. <laughs> That are the most important characters in the entire list. We'll get down to the end, and number one will be Adolfo. That's Death. right. It'll all make sense. Uh, amazing. So, also, we, not to Richard Croyce Landry, classic, who okay. read that whole book. And then, yes, and then live tweeted while he was reading it. Thank you, Richard. And came to the conclusion of shrug. What? Of, I don't know. What? Yeah. Interesting. So, putting that away, we're done with English class. We can okay, put dumb fantastic. Luck back on the shelf. Uh, <laughs> my other, my other random points for this episode, because again, I, I did this with more than one novel for this arc, guys. We'll get to them both. Um, and also, if people have, if other people have decided to go track down a copy of Dumb Luck and read it and have figured out some other insights, please feel free to share them with us. So my other points for this episode as we as we get past a uh, little English class, I laughed way too hard at Artemis saying, go, or I'll call Batman. Yeah. Okay, fine, you can stay. Uh, Gorfin's one, not Gorfin, come on. Like, no, or if I love your care. response. Response. But also, I love that Artemis is like, only card to play was I'll call Batman, fully knowing that she just, wouldn't bother to call Batman and giving up because I just love this generation of young adult heroes being absolute chaos because <laughs> they've been in Orphan's position or like, that won't stop me. And Artemis is like, 
Yeah, it wouldn't have stopped me either. Gosh, <laughs> I don't have any other I don't have any other cards to play. Batman totally stopped Wally and Dick and Calder <laughs> from creating the team. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that totally worked. Also, speaking of perfect lines from this, we have How Are You Kidding? She still goes by Artemis Croc. It took me three minutes on the internet. It is <laughs> amazing. I mean, it, from the very beginning, it's like, wait, so her name is her superhero name? And her superhero name is her actual? Okay. It's not much of a secret identity. Which, But like, at least the, the original team, the kind of thing was like, well, nobody knows that you're superheroes. No, but, yeah. Um, you're not public facing heroes, but as time has gone on, yeah, the shadows have encountered the team so many times that they're like, "Ah, oh, yes, that's Artemis. We might as well have her trading card. Uh, that's funny. I had a question about like, so there's the moment where where uh, uh, Orphan is just like, "Hey, telepathy, let's get this going, right?" Yes. And then Looker just tells what's saying, what she's got going on in her head, and it makes me think like. I was thinking like, okay, so do they have technology that would allow her to be able to communicate that way? I mean, I I could see Orphan just as a character not wanting any of that anyway. But like the what about the what about the thing that lets Beast Boy talk when he's in different animal forms? Right. And um, and the gorillas, you know what I mean? And and that kind of stuff. If I were to make an argument for that, if I were if I were to try for that. Yeah. All of Beast Boy's animal forms still have intact vocal cords. But then why doesn't he just talk? That's what I'm thinking. They they don't have vocal. I mean, they can make noises, I guess. But like, that's where I'm because he Martian technology. No, absolutely. Yeah, no doubt. I totally I totally get that. There's some funky tech. And, And I don't know what I don't know if that would even work with with Orphan's particular situation. But like, still, I'm like thinking like, wow, they have a lot of really high tech stuff and telepathic gizmos and all of these, like all these things that could be done. But I, as I said, bottom line is I could also see orphan just going like, get that away from me. I don't need any of that. You know what I mean? If it makes her uncomfortable, she's not going to use it. And we know from like the, the comics we've seen, I don't remember if we see it in the show itself. We probably do. I can't remember for sure, but like orphan knows sign language and uses sign language in the comics um but that is a good point i think it's a c- cool the way that they are showing like this idea of showing all of the different ways that orphan communicates with everyone since she can't speak uh but yeah. yeah i do get i do get the question my other stuff i continue with my post artemis uh saying just trying to again offer to jade what if we just all lived together uh you know to protect leon and for no other reason uh i again say when harper croc household spinoff sitcom where jade will leon and artemis just all live together in perfect disharmony (laughs) thank you i i I send this out into the world i want it so badly and related to that if anyone out there wants more insight into the whole black spider saying cheshire just betrayed the shadows for a guy reference go look up the red arrow journals from the young justice legacy video oh yeah the video game that's right yeah that's that's basically what happened, but like you get to at least hear some of Will's thoughts about it. <laughs> because Will was, for a time there, in the League of Shadows, alongside Cheshire. And then, if I'm remembering co- correctly, he blew his cover by accident, or they found out something that he wasn't really, you know, committed to the Shadows. And Cheshire decided to stick with him, and they fought their way out, and and later they got married. <laughs> Oops. Amazing. My kingdom also for anything just showing that whole full story from the Red Arrow journals. Show these two disaster humans falling in love, please and thank you. Other Cheshire things from this episode, we have uh, I love Cheshire just telling Artemis you can't be serious. Don't take these two people, take your team, because just Cheshire out here with just a decade of seeing Artemis and her little sidekick friends go absolutely everywhere they're not supposed to go, being absolutely baffled by Artemis agreeing to a villain's uh, ultimatum terms. And also, I like how she's like, I think you just need to kill both of them. And then Orphan pulls her sword. Yep. He starts to pull her sword. I was like, uh, 
Where a whole what? Hold on. Orphan's up. got her own moral compass. Orphan's just Orphan's just living her best life. <laughs> and I I have thought for the group. Would love to hear other opinions on this. How are we feeling about the whole Jade never showing up again thing? Because it personally does not sit right with me. And I have my theories, but I'd love to hear other people's theories too. What do you what what are you referring to now? Oh, never showing up again. Oh, in the flashback where she where she takes, takes off the and food then... and then says, I'll be back. I'll be back tomorrow and you won't get in any trouble. And then just doesn't show up. Uh that moment right there is actually where I absolutely dislike Cheshire the most. Okay. Like yeah. I am entertained by Cheshire. I like her as a character. I see the trauma that this poor girl has been through. And for that moment there where she like gives her a book, even though we've now decided she just grabbed a random one to bring, she promised that she would be back. And then the consequences to Artemis were awful, just awful. And Jay and Jay knew that. Like yeah. she specifically says, I will bring you money. And there may be, I mean, there's, I mean, there could be tie in comics galore about what actually happened and why she couldn't make it and blah, blah, blah. But the way that it's presented in this episode is she just doesn't, she just chooses not to, as far as we know. And, um, w- one armed boxing a nine year old with a broken arm. I, I just, I, I have, I, I have like real visceral reactions to that. Yeah. Of course. Mine's the darker timeline. Mine is that Sportsmaster is the reason she didn't show in my head. The idea that because if he knows that she has the food, I mean I mean that it's not a logical it's not a huge logical leap to decide that there's no food. I saw her, her here, she asked you to get it in earshot of me, but it's also not illogical to for him to keep tabs on her. Oh, yeah, you know he is. is. And then also double down on breaking that relationship between the two of them by doing something about it. You know, I mean, I have no evidence. Because I've there's no evidence that but headcanon, all that makes a lot of sense. Because I have my two my two headcanons, my two thoughts on this scene were either that Cheshire got waylaid at some point off screen. And I do like your theory of it being sportsmaster like before she could get back that like something literally prevented her from doing it. Cause for all of Cheshire's faults, I believed her and I don't want to just not believe her in that scene for what she's doing because Cheshire has always cared about Artemis. Uh, I a hundred percent believed her as well. Yeah. And so I want to believe something else happened. Yes. I want to believe Neil's thing because I already hate Crusher like all the, all the way. My other, Similar connected headcanon is that Sportsmaster came back earlier expected uh, earlier than expected on purpose because like Artemis looks genuinely very surprised when he finds oh, her yeah, and whether sure. that's oh you found out where I go and hide or if that's she thought she had more time because like she gives she gives Jade a very specific window of time and I would absolutely believe like Sportsmaster comes home 12 hours early and their entire plan blows up you know what i mean well it is because, yeah absolutely because it's at night she says we'll meet tomorrow night and i'll have the money and she says that crusher has gone for 36 hours yeah right he's supposed to be gone for a day and a half so you're set so he does show up or, or yep. yeah mm-hmm. for sure okay uh yeah <laughs> we're unless, the, unless the she's there for an extra there's no extra let's do more there's no time stamps no no Give me time stamps None of the flashbacks have timestamps in this one, and it frustrates me to no end. But yeah, it's the thing of like, though, all of this scene and all of this, these flashbacks with Treasure and Artemis, I think really tie into the thing that we talked about in the first arc, too, about like the idea of like, I was just a kid, too, which continues to be like a really important thing with all of these characters dealing with their sibling relationships of that idea of like looking up to your older sibling and then having to like reckon with the fact of like, they were also a child trying to survive and they couldn't always protect you kind of thing. Right. And this is like the thing that goes back to what I was talking about, about 
like you can be stuck at that age uh maturity wise or on the flip side you have to grow up too fast right and look back and take oh personal responsibility for a thing that i did when i was 13 you know like because like that is also the thing of like when she when Cheshire runs away the thing that she says to artemis is you should get out too like Cheshire knows like this is not good for you and we can't stay here but also knows like I can't be responsible for a nine-year-old, like that kind of thing. And it's just a whole, they're a whole complicated disaster mess. And everyone in that family needs therapy and a hug uh, and to sort some things out and then to have a sitcom. But yeah, I just wanted to hear theories. I like Neil's theory. I like hearing some perspectives on that scene. Yeah, that scene I, is a lot. me too. The other theory I have is if she she couldn't get the money and she was too embarrassed to go back. That's that is a thing that I could see. How is Cheshire gonna get the money? I am also gonna throw that out as the thing that finally has crossed. Oh my no, mind of- she's a hundred percent gonna steal it. Of but course, like yeah, but or like, some other even form at, of illegal- even at thir- <laughs> right, even at thirteen, I feel like she's gonna beat a guy in could- an alleyway and then take her take a st- he's, Yeah, she's gonna mug somebody. I mean, if, even at thirteen, I think that she could easily like get the money so like i think about that but i'm like that's the that that's possible like in the real world i absolutely get that that could be a possible thing but like but that's the less interesting narrative choice there it is that's exactly what i was gonna say yeah the more interesting is like the characters having active all the characters having an active participation in what's happening and in this case um sportsmaster actively trying to break all this stuff and like being super arrogant about how much he is manipulating and controlling his children because he needs to compensate for whatever horrifying thing happened to him as a child. So yeah, he's a bad dad, bad dad. And on the other end of the spectrum, my final note for today is uh, simply says, Craig, my good boy, Craig, somebody yes. go hug that boy. Aww. And for those who may have missed this at the, the, over the credits, the credit scene for this episode is Craig, the littlest genome who loved Connor the most of all, is watching the is either watching the Superboy fan memorial tribute video that we have seen going around, or since the picture that they show in the frame on the table is different because mm-hmm. it's it's him and the other um, the genome double was slipping X. my mind. Yes, uh, double X instead of the photo that it is in the fan memorial. Craig may be attending a separate memorial in Geranium City. I can't say for sure. It could be just oh, maybe this video yeah, pans across that. many things. I don't know. Yeah, he's mourning his buddy and I'm not okay. <laughs> yeah. There's so much stuff with just everybody being sad about Superboy for the next several episodes and it hurts my little heart. Craig is the is the genome who taught Connor about about the moon and the everything and he's yeah. and the sun and he's he's a good good little guy he's a good love little him. buddy he's good yes, he's a do. good little buddy i love I he love has him. i love he got a name he ended up getting the name craig with a, K. It's a good name for him craig with a k and on that note stick around class is in session so today for our canary debrief i'm going to be talking a little bit about literary illusions So throughout this arc, we see Artemis reading different books and quoting many of those books over the end credits sequences. While I'll be breaking down each of those books individually over the next few episodes, I wanted to take a minute to discuss how they all work together as a whole. We've all probably seen a show or movie do a very heavy-handed literary illusion, like a teen show having the characters perform a high school play that just so happens to mirror the drama happening in their own offstage lives extremely directly. (laughs) But what Young Justice does is a little subtler. The books shown and the quotes said in Young Justice aren't explained or elaborated on. Often they go largely unacknowledged by the characters, What they do instead is make the viewer ask questions. Last episode, A Tale of Two Cities was used to talk about love, sacrifice, and family. Important themes for this arc, but also important themes to connect back to Connor's sacrifice, as shown in the ending credits. 
Similarly, last episode also had a quick reference to Les Mis, with the quote written in French on the whiteboard, a quote taken from a scene about forgiveness and redemption, the things Artemis is so desperate to give to her sister, the Zark. In this week's episode, the connections to the book actively featured feel a little bit more tenuous to me, but another viewer might have some much deeper insight to offer about the connections between Artemis, Cheshire, and Dumb Luck. Next week's episode more directly ties a famous short story to the themes of uncertainty and doubt, and the final episode of Artemis's arc will show her reading I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, a book about growing up about the loss of innocence, about having complicated relationships with your family members, about trying to overcome hardship and live a life you're proud of. All themes that resonate throughout Artemis' story across four seasons of the show. But Young Justice never explicitly tells us any of this about the books being referenced. These kinds of illusions aren't mimicking, adapting, or even reimagining those iconic stories. They're not retelling them. Instead, they're existing in conversation with them, drawing connections that enrich the narrative being told on screen. These kinds of illusions don't prescribe a definitive reading, but prompt the viewer to ask questions. Why this book? Why this quote? What's the connection? And the story being told becomes richer for it. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. For this week's fan service, we're featuring the podcast Team Up Moves. Team Up Moves is a superhero actual play RPG podcast in which hosts Fiona and Stephanie play a bunch of different superhero games to build out their fictional superhero city of New Arcadia. They bring on different guests from across the RPG, superhero, comic book, and podcasting worlds to create fun and interesting characters and play different games to tell different aspects of the superhero genre. Every corner of this fictional city is full of new and interesting adventures, and you may even hear a couple of voices that you've heard on our podcast before, including Jeff Stormer. And they've played games you may have heard us talk about here before, like Masks, A New Generation, or Anyone Can Wear the Mask, as well as new and old superhero games from tons of different designers. It's a really fun show. I had the privilege of being on an episode this summer where we played Marvelous, a teenage superhero story game. Um, But there's just a lot to check out there. It's really fun. Give it a listen. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 4. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories, speculations about what we see based on wild flights of fancy. So uh, Beast, Beast Boy is really not having a good time. He's not doing too well. No, and Halo is a mother box. Um, Halo is and Superboy is not dead. So don't worry about it. And Superboy is yeah. not dead. All of these he's things. Wait, are he's, true. he's got. He's he's doing the longest bleed out in history. He's got a bleed out on pause. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. So yeah, like that's the thing. Like I don't have anything to say about it other than that we're just seeing more of how no, Beast Boy no, is not fair. doing well. Uh, he's, no, he's sleeping a lot. He's rewatching Connor's memorial on repeat. He's turning off the news the second his girlfriend is supposed to be on it. Uh, all of these things are not signs of doing well. They are, in fact, signs of doing poorly. Yeah. And that will get addressed eventually. We also, speaking of the news. So you brought it up, though. Like, I want to, or I want to say, so I recently did a rewatch and I have some interesting theories about two versions of Young Justice being season one, season, season one and two and season three and four. But watching them all together, yeah. man, the hits just keep coming for Gar and they just never yeah. were addressed. They don't stop. And they don't stop. They're, and they're never addressed properly. And so, like, watching it really back to back the way I have now, 
it's like, well, I see it a lot more. I see it more now that we're seeing the things that echo out of season three into season four and then just again and again and again. But it also makes me think about that same conversation of like, oh, we were just kids. Um, and like when he lost his mother and, and things like that. So, yeah, Gar's having one heck of a time. Yeah, then he had the Doom Patrol. But there was that whole thing with the custody thing they talked about, um, whether, you know, with uh, Mento. <laughs> and uh, I, it's just it's just awful. It's just awful. It's been too long since this kid. And, you know, for even after his, even when we first saw him in season two, like he's joyful and he's happy and he's got a family, and he's doing stuff. And so I think people just thought he was OK. And even at that point, with the five year skip, he'd lost two moms and the Doom Patrol. And so, yeah. It's like literally the second episode of season two that we see him have like a post-traumatic stress disorder episode. Like his mom. we see him get yeah. triggered by a waterfall and just shut down. Like that's yeah. very early in season two. Like this, this has been coming for a while. And a reminder to people that what happened leading up to that scene that he's flashing back to tie in comics. This whole episode's been go get the tie-in comics. Yeah, for sure. We also, we get the setup in this episode that Brion is welcoming all of the metahumans into Markovia, which will come up later this season and, say it with me, in the tie-in comics. Yeah, yeah. In the tie-in comics, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then for a, a brief return to, to English class, the quote over the credits for this uh, episode, well, Craig is crying about Superboy um, is from through the looking glass and what Alice found there, which uh, Artemis is reading earlier in the episode in one of the flashbacks. And it's the whole thing of Alice and the unicorn that leads to the, if you believe in me, then I'll believe in you thing, which you can totally interpret all of that as kind of a reference to Artemis and Cheshire and both of them needing to trust each other and rely on each other in this arc. And like, that's the only way anything's going to get done. But, this also will eventually, when we find out where Superboy is, mirror the thing that Connor says to Phantom Girl about how, what if we're like, it's something about like both of them not being real or dealing with all this stuff. And he's like, I'll make you a deal. You believe in me and I'll believe in you. Uh, mm-hmm. even though she's unconscious and he is just trying to to struggle his way through everything that's going to happen to Connor this season, which is Superboy is not doing well. <laughs> no, well, which I always just thought was a very interesting setup because we get this quote and then like 10 episodes later, like we don't see yeah. Connor for a while. We hear him say that. And I remember the second it happened, I was like, oh, it, it all makes sense now. <laughs> like I full on did the, the point at the screen mean uh, of being like, oh, wait, when stuff like that happens now and it takes that long to set up something in any TV show, I'm just going to point at it and say Adolfo. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to end up like referring because I just know there's a oh, long there's a long con it's the center of the conspiracy. Oh, word. my gosh. How long did it take them to do the freaking magic bus joke? Yep. Come on, guys. Four yep. seasons for the magic bus joke. Admit, admittedly, there's a lot. I still feel like there's things in there that we haven't realized because on the on my same oh, yeah. watch I, when after the blood transfusion that Gar gets, the monkey is gnawing on him. Uh, yep. Yeah, I I, and yeah. I refer to that way back in the day yeah. and stuff like that. that. Monkey, well, monkey is monkey's biting his biting his shoulder, which is what his original origin was. Absolutely. And, and my my crash in the mode is the shade jade combo because she yep. frees, she frees him from his control when no one assumes that she would in the previous season, then I assume this is probably the first time she's seeing him again. And she has that visceral reaction, not, not audibly and shade looks away. He totally turns away. Yeah. He shows up and he's like, I cannot make act awkward. Yeah. He'll, he'll make good on that. It'll be okay. And I love shade for, I love this character <laughs> for some reason that I can't really put my finger on, but he'll no, make I get up it. For he's it. like super minor. He only shows up a couple of times, but he's fun. So how do you, he's got a fun he energy. Is. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, he'll yeah. he'll make good on it here in a few episodes. So we'll be fine. Yeah, awesome. All right, get a, get a play, pay well, off for all that. And with all that, I think we can zeta out of the watchtower.
If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on our website, crashingthemode.com, and you can even email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have to look a little bit harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. Stay Stay whelmed, whelmed, everyone. everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.